Good morning. I cannot tell you how good it is to see people up in the pews visiting beforehand. And that is that's a wonderful feeling. This morning, I'd like to begin reading from Psalm 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. We have an opportunity to do just that this morning. We're thankful you're with us. If you are visiting with us, we especially want to thank you for being with us. Stick around and let us uh, get to know you a little bit better. This morning we'll be led in singing by Sam Harding at the appropriate time. Kevin Kogus will have our first prayer. So will you join with us as we worship our God together? Song number 100. Thirty-four. Oh. 
Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Holy, righteous, kind, merciful Father. We humble ourselves before you, dear Heavenly Father. We know that in you is all authority and power. You spoke the world into existence and we humble ourselves before your great and magnificent power. You set forth life in this world, dear Heavenly Father, and we see it all around us and we humble ourselves to your great wisdom we're thankful, dear Heavenly Father, for your Son, Christ Jesus, and the plan of salvation that is through him. And we pray, dear Heavenly Father, for our hearts to be open and receptive to your holy word. And may we look upon your words, dear Heavenly Father, to see and mark ourselves like your Son, loving and caring and kind to others. His prayers to you in a diligent, loving manner and how he studied every day, dear Heavenly Father. May we strive for the mark that is in him. Father, we pray now that you will forgive us of our sins. Forgive us of our sins, Holy Father, so that our prayer will not be hindered by them. Forgive us when we say the wrong things and do not encourage others, when we think things that are not right and good, and when we do things, dear Heavenly Father, that are in contrary to your written word. And we pray, dear Heavenly Father, you will forgive us of the things that we do that, uh, that are conflict with your word that we did not intend to do. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, that the blood of Jesus will cleanse us from our sins so our prayer will come to you acceptable and pleasing in thy sight. We pray now, Father, for wisdom to go about in our lives. We pray for this wisdom, dear Heavenly Father, so that we will not stumble, we will keep ourselves true and faithful. But we know we have an advocate with you through Jesus. So when we do stumble, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, you are faithful, dear Heavenly Father, and you will cleanse us from our sins. But we ask for that wisdom, dear Heavenly Father, that we will do our best in this pathway of life. Pray, dear Heavenly Father, for those that, that work against us. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, that those who seek out evil, we pray for them, dear Heavenly Father, and that you will help them to see the gospel light. May our, may our pillow be rocks, dear Heavenly Father, until the gospel of Christ goes out to all of this world. We pray, Holy Father, that... Uh, we will be about living our lives in such a manner that they will see Christ living in us. Help us, dear Heavenly Father, to, to be that gospel light, either through the study of your word to others or by the life we live, dear Heavenly Father. May they ask for the hope that is in all of us. We pray now, dear Heavenly Father, for the families of this congregation. We pray that you will strengthen them in this time when we find ourselves uh, with confusing messages out there, and we pray that the uh, mothers and fathers will uh, diligently help their children to lead them down the straight and narrow path. We pray for their steadfastness, dear Heavenly Father, as the children, as they grow older, that they will accept uh, the gospel call and be faithful soldiers for Christ. We pray now, dear Heavenly Father, for the elders of this congregation. We pray for Kevin and David, we pray for Steve and Russ, and we pray for Bobby. We pray that you will help them, dear Heavenly Father, as they make decisions both spiritually and physically concerning the events that are occurring now in our lives. We pray that you will help them to uh, strengthen all of us, find assurance that uh, the words that are going to be taught will be uh, to the betterment of our souls. We're thankful for these men and the time that they give, dear Heavenly Father. We pray that you will bless them and help them in their decisions. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, that you'll be with Kevin today and help him as he 
teaches us from your word. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, that we will let it dwell in our hearts and that when we leave this building, it will not stay here, but go out with us, dear Heavenly Father, and may we take it into the world. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, that you will uh, be with the sick and help them. We pray for those that with terrible diseases that, uh, that received bad news this week. We pray that you will uh, help them to find strength to continue their battle. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, for the events that occurred with Mark. We pray that you will give him strength to recover quickly so he may return to us. We pray, Holy Father, that uh, you will help those that uh, have been afflicted with illnesses. Help them, dear Heavenly Father, so that they may uh, recover. May your hand be on the doctors and nurses administrating to them, dear Heavenly Father, that they may return to us quickly. We pray now, dear Heavenly Father, that as we leave this congregation today, may we uh, take Jesus into our heart and go out into the world, Holy Father, and, and may they see Christ living in us by the way we speak, by the way we act, by the way we treat each other, and by the way we treat others in the world. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, amen. To help prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper. Number, number 90. Number 90. Hi, To prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper that we're about to partake, I'll be reading from the book of Mark, chapter 14, verses 22 through 26. I'll be reading now the English Standard Version. Mark 14, 22 through 26. And as they were eating, he took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to them, and said, Take, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. 
Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the day which I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Let's pray for the bread. Dear Father in heaven, as we've gathered here this morning, we've been worshiping you. We pause for a few moments to partake of this Holy Communion. As we prepare ourselves to partake of the bread, dear Father, we reflect back upon your son, the life that he led here on earth as he taught us a more perfect way, as he lived and showed us a true and perfect example. And then he gave his life for our sins. We pray, dear Father, as we reflect upon that sacrifice that he made on our behalf, that we might examine ourselves and compare how we live our lives, that we might try to compare it not to the worldly standard, but that, to that ultimate standard, that perfect standard, that we might try to be more like him in our, our daily walk. We pray, dear Father, we'll take this bread in a manner that's pleasing to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pray for the cup. Dear Father in heaven, as we continue this memorial feast and we prepare to take a, the cup, we're so thankful for your son and his sacrifice, the blood that washes away our sins and makes us new, pure, and holy again. We live in a world that's full of stress and concerns and People are bogged down by the, the weight of the events that are going on around them and their sins. Lord, we're so thankful for the ability to have that weight removed from us, to be light and pure, and clean. And the knowledge that we're able to abide in your presence. We pray, dear Father, that we never take for granted that, that great sacrifice that was made in our behalf pray, dear Father, that always be mindful of that sacrifice and, and live a life that is according to it. We pray, dear Father, as we take this cup, we might take it in manners pleasing to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
separate and apart from the Lord's Supper, we now take this time to give back to the Lord as we have prospered. The elders have set forth several different ways for the congregation as a matter of convenience to, uh, to contribute back to the Lord. Uh, there is the online giving program where you can go to our website and you can give online. There's also a bucket in the back of the auditorium that you can place your contribution there. Or uh, after the prayer, uh, some gentlemen will pass through the congregation to uh, take up your collection if you prefer to give that way. Please raise your hand at the conclusion of the prayer and, and we'll come to you. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, we are very rich and prosperous people. We're so thankful for the, the many things which you've blessed us with. Our jobs, our talents, our abilities, and the different opportunities we have to, to work and serve in your kingdom. We pray, dear Father, that you'll be with this congregation and be with this money that's collected that might be used for the furtherance of your kingdom. We're so thankful for our elders and the programs they've challenged this congregation with. And we pray, dear Father, that we will act as you would want us to as we try to reach out and evangelize this community and throughout the world. We pray, dear Father, as we give, that we might give in a cheerful manner. We pray us in Jesus' name. Amen. Two hundred ninety eight. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm not a If you're using the book, the song after the lesson will be 436, 436. At this time, we'll sing number 59.
Scripture this morning will be taken from Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 through 18. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted." Whenever I'm asked to speak as a guest at another congregation, I'm typically asked to provide some kind of biographical information that helps introduce me to that congregation. And this is supposed to be a brief type of resume to provide some credibility as a speaker beyond the promises of the local preacher. This really is no different than what an application might require for employment or what you'd put on a college uh, application in ways. You want to list off things that you've done of reasons why people want want you to do whatever you're asking to do. And I think most people can provide a pretty good list of accomplishments to put on a resume if the focus is right. I think most people can do that. But while we live in a culture very attuned to accomplishments in, in one sense, we can also ignore the most important type of accomplishments. For example, we we recognize the accomplishment of graduating with various levels of education. But we do not always recognize the meaning of a good work ethic. We recognize the accomplishment of a good salary, but we do not necessarily appreciate the sacrifices necessary to train our children properly. We recognize the accomplishments of fame and fortune, but we do not always recognize the simple tasks of daily living with virtue, morality, and faith. We can sometimes look back at our own lives and see many things we've accomplished. Raising a family to be faithful to God working a job or building a business with integrity, learning skills and doing things that benefit others. Those are worthwhile things to do. But what we ought to do far more often is look to Jesus and all that he accomplished in a very brief time upon this earth. The author of the book of Hebrews captures our attention and points to just that. You know, the entire book of Hebrews, in in a way, is presenting Jesus' resume as the Messiah to the Jewish people. And as he is finishing his introduction to this book, in chapter 2, verses 14 through 18, he now is essentially summing up where he's going of why Jesus has accomplished everything that truly matters or that ought to matter to us. So of all the things that people have done in life, and it's okay to appreciate what you've accomplished, but nothing matters more than what Jesus accomplished. So let's consider a few things here this morning. First of all, in verse 14 of Hebrews chapter 2, we find that Jesus emerged victorious in his battle with Satan. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. 
In Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10, it is summarized in this way. Then I heard a voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God, the power of his Christ, have come. For the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down. If you look in the context, that's what he's talking about is the same thing. A great battle with Satan did not occur in God's dwelling place, but in the spiritual realm where Jesus fought against temptation upon the earth. That's what he's talking about, what we ought to be interested in. Matthew chapter 4, 1 through 11. Jesus was doing battle. Satan comes on. He had see, Jesus hasn't eaten 40 days and 40 nights, and Satan sees weakness, and he goes after him. And Satan is defeated in that moment and in every moment of Jesus' life. And that's the point he is making here. Every other man, all of us, we lost our battle with Satan, but not Jesus. Jesus not only won his battle, he won the war for us because he fought in the battlefield of his own humanity by coming to this earth. He accepted then death for himself. And I want you to notice in the text, he accepted death and turned it into a weapon of victory against Satan and against death itself. In Psalm 22, as we read through that prophetic psalm about the Messiah, all about the crucifixion and being on the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But as we move through that psalm, it reaches a point and it says, in some of the manuscripts, you have answered me. And at that moment, everything changes in that psalm because Jesus is victorious. He has won. He accepted that death so that he could bring us through our own death. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 55 through 57. He had to defeat Satan to cement for eternity the sovereignty of God. And that's what he did. If there was ever any question who was greater, or even if there, Satan was his equal, Jesus settled it by defeating him. So that in Matthew 28, verse 18, having been raised from the dead, he could say, all power hath been given unto me in heaven and earth. Satan may have been able to win his battle with Adam and Eve and with us as well, but he lost to Jesus. And that has made all the difference for us too. Second of all, because of this and related to it, you look at what Jesus accomplished. Jesus conquered death for all of us. Verse 15, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. I actually think in ways part of the problem we have reaching people is that they don't even know they're living in bondage. We have people celebrating death that should not be celebrating people's deaths. They think that they get victory automatically. And they don't even believe in the person who won the war. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 19, and 20, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. When Jesus rose from the grave on the third day, he established his own authority over death. But he also fulfilled the promise to mankind that Satan and death would not have the last say on us either. That was Genesis 3, verse 15. Jesus came to make sure of it. He ensured that death does not need to have power over anyone. Remember Matthew 16? Peter has just confessed him, that he is indeed Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus then says, on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. 
what Jesus was doing and what he is accomplishing was overcoming death for us. And that gives us hope to replace fear. So many people just, again, take for granted. Death, no big deal. If we are actually looking at ourselves from a spiritual point of view and we don't have any freedom from our sin, death would be a big deal indeed. If we are sinners who are going to be judged by God and death is the final say, that would indeed be sad. Jesus came and he conquered death so it wouldn't be sad, so that there'd be hope. So that in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, he could talk about God's abundant mercy that he's begotten us again unto a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He gave us freedom from a life of spiritual slavery to offer us a life of spiritual sonship. Romans chapter 8, verse 15, whereby we cry out, Abba, Father. And that's why there's no need for anyone to fear death anymore. It is a hard thing to hear a pronouncement of disease without a cure. It's hard on the family, and it's certainly hard on the person who hears it. I can't imagine to hear it without faith. What Jesus did in conquering death was what made it possible for us to look. And no matter what the disease is, no matter what the problem has been, Jesus is still greater and he has overcome that problem if we will stick with him. We still have to suffer physical death, but that will mean nothing if we'll but embrace the one who holds eternal life in his hand. Thirdly, verse 16 and into verse 17, Jesus established a new priesthood. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. I'll stop right there. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, Peter said, You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. God appointed Jesus to a new high priesthood. He begins to argue that in chapter 5. What this did was it established, though, that the Levitical priesthood and the covenant with Israel was insufficient and designed to be temporary. God did not want animal sacrifices always to be offered. He did not want his people limited geographically. He did not want his people limited by race. Jesus came to give us something better. The church. He established a priesthood available to all men on behalf of all men in the covenant for all men. That's the point of verse 16. Now, I would argue here that the King James actually has the better translation. You would get from reading this that the idea of giving aid that occurs later on in verse 18 and the word given here in verse 16 are the same. They are not. But rather the word here used means to take upon oneself. The purpose depends upon the context. And what he is doing here is he is emphasizing Not who his aid he came to, but who he became part of. He had just been talking about how he had what he had shared in, and he is emphasizing to them their importance, not just as an object of salvation, but as a people with whom Jesus totally identifies. The seed of Abraham. He's coming to them and talking about you're forgetting why you are here. He had just been talking about angels through chapter 1. And they had this 
odd kind of history with angels through some of their literature. And he refocuses them and says, Jesus came for you to be one with you, to help you, but to be part of you as a people. In doing so, this is where he established a covenant. Hebrews chapter 7, 20 through 22. But what this also meant of being a new priesthood, we have to understand the role. As a messenger that he'll get to in chapter 3, he could be a messenger just coming down and speaking to men on behalf of God. That's what the messenger did, the lawgiver does. He comes down to crack down. Not the high priest. The role of the high priest is to represent man to God. And that's why he became man. To represent us, he needed to be one of us. And therefore, he needed to accept the limitations of man if he was going to represent all of our weaknesses, all of our needs, our need for God, and our needs to God. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, this is presented by Paul. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Great God in heaven becomes small man on the earth. And yet he lived in such a way as to display God and to live for God and in doing so to live for man. He became a high priest through his faithfulness to God and for the cause of mercy. That's why in Mark chapter 10 verse 45 he says the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. They're related. He came and he looked at us and he says what do you need most? You need you need redemption. You need to be bought back. Jesus is the high priest of perfection, offering intercession not through this annual visit to the most holy place in an earthly tabernacle, but by his ongoing presence in the holiest place of all, heaven. Fourthly, Jesus made forgiveness possible. I think sometimes when we pray, we do not appreciate that as an accomplishment. Sometimes we let our prayers be and forgive us of all our sins right before in Jesus' name, and it's kind of like the, the ending part of a book. And we need to spend some time thinking what it took to make forgiveness possible. The phrase here in verse 17, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. You know, Eddie did a fantastic lesson on propitiation recently. And all of that is captured here. He is making forgiveness possible for people who had no other way to get it. In Ephesians 1 and verse 7, it says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. When we remembered Jesus this morning and partake of the Lord's Supper, remember that the, the cup is the new covenant in my blood. This is what it took. Not a little bit of grape juice, but a whole lot of Jesus' blood spilled. For a new covenant to be given that could offer forgiveness for us. You know, dating back to Adam and Eve, that fateful day in the garden, from that point forward, forgiveness has been man's greatest need. 
and Jesus came to fulfill it. He appeased God's sense of justice by the moral perfection of his life. He fulfilled the need for a sacrifice for sins when he offered up himself. Hebrews chapter 7, 26 and 27. Such a high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the people's. But this he did once when he offered up himself. And in doing so, he was reaching out to offer forgiveness to all. All of us who have ever needed forgiveness. And he did that by becoming one with all of us who needed forgiveness. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, it says, Of God who desires all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth, for there is one God and one mediator between God and the man, the man Jesus Christ. We need man as a mediator, and Jesus is the one. He's also God, but he had to become man. If anything was going to change for man, he had to be forgiven, Isaiah chapter 59, verse 2. And for man to be forgiven, Jesus had to come to the earth. Jesus had to be perfect. Jesus had to die. Jesus had to be raised. And Jesus had to be preached. Without that, you realize we have nothing. All of it. And there's a lot to every single one of those. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life, John 3, verse 16. And indeed, if you look at Acts chapter 2, verse 21, all the way through 38 in Peter's sermon, that's what he's saying. Thanks be to God that Jesus has done all of this for us. Fifthly, verse 18. Jesus overcame temptation and sin perfectly. And this puts together everything else. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Later on in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, it says that he had, at all points tempted like as we, yet without sin. We've said this before, but I want to repeat it now. Jesus faced a world just as wicked, just as tempting, just as trying and just as exasperating as the one in which we live. But Jesus overcame it. He has experienced the trial of temptation in the most trying circumstances imaginable. You know, sometimes I, I think we, we make excuses for ourselves and say, well, Jesus didn't go through this. No, he went through a lot worse. And he was still without sin. Though he were a son, yet learned the obedience for the things which he suffered. Being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation and all them that obey him. Despite all of the pressure on him, and, and I can't begin to imagine it. You see, he's walking around for years knowing this is his fate. He's teaching people that sometimes are pretty clueless. And he knows he needs them to declare his victory. He's interacting with people who want to kill him. And he rises above it. And when they come to get him, he does not resist it. When they put his hands and his feet on the cross, he accepted it. You think he wasn't tempted through all of that? That's pressure. One little slip up. It's not, I'll lose my job. It's not, oh, my parents are going to be mad. It's not, oh, no, what's Eddie going to say? It's everyone is lost. 
His moral perfection enabled him to accomplish all of these things mentioned to provide exactly what we needed as sinners. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Revelation 5.12 None of us can come close to laying claim to moral perfection. But Jesus can. And that can make a difference for us too. Now I think that there are two major things that we can take from all of this. First, no matter what we've accomplished in our lives, it always will pale in comparison to what Christ accomplished. And that should inform our every decision. And we need to keep that in mind when our resume goes up on display. Second, no matter what your resume looks like, and no matter whether you consider yourself educated or non-educated, wealthy or poor, successful or unsuccessful, Jesus loved you enough to do all this for you. And those other things didn't matter. You know, my friends, I have walked across the stage at graduation a number of times in my life. I've been introduced in flattering ways that I doubt I deserved on a number of occasions. And I'm honored to be here working with you at the school. But I want you to know this. There's no greater sense of accomplishment that I've ever felt than knowing that my pointing someone to Jesus Christ and the gospel has changed the destiny of that person's soul. That for me is what matters, even if it's not really an accomplishment. Jesus is the one who accomplished things that really matter. That doesn't mean that you need to pull your resume or soften everything. It just gives us perspective to appreciate what he did. Why we should love him and why we should obey him. He gave everything on that cross to give us an opportunity to belong to God by simply responding, listening, repenting, and obeying through faith. This is the Savior you can have. But if you have not been baptized for remission of your sins to become part of his people, you may wonder, well, what's the big deal about that? We'd want to study it with you. Because I think it's important you understand what was done to make that mean something. If you are a Christian, let's not take for granted all the things that Jesus has done. Just show up, sing some songs, enjoy the moment. Let's dig deeper within ourselves so that when we offer up our praise, when we speak to someone about the gospel, we have a full appreciation in that moment for what Jesus really accomplished. If you need the prayers of the church, if you'd like to study with us, or if you have something in your life that, that you need help with, we want to give you that opportunity. We are here for you. And Jesus died for you. If you are then subject to the invitation, won't you please come now while we stand and sing.
seated, please. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Thank you. I want to welcome all the visitors and those members. I like those here too. I see so many faces that I don't know, and I see some faces that I, I do know, and I'm glad to see again. Um, we do want to ask you to take the card from the pew in front of you, both members and visitors alike, and please sign that so we can have a record of your attendance. As we, uh, as in a prayer mentioned earlier, Mark Selby has been moved to a rehab facility and has begun physical therapy. And they're asking for no visits right now, please, but prayers are appreciated. Opal Bijek is at home recovering from her knee surgery. Renee Burgess, the back surgery is scheduled for June the 8th. We did get a note that Kathy Rice's latest scan uh, showed that her cancer was back and they've requested no visitors this time, but we do want us to keep Kathy and her sweet family in our prayers. Our brother Bob Ritchie and his family will be making a trip this week uh, to lay his late wife Beth's ashes to rest. Let's keep him in your prayers as they go through that. I'd like you to pray for all the kids and all the sponsors that are going to our camps this week, Camp Bandina and Camp Blue Haven, uh, that they travel safely and that a lot of good work is done there. So remember those. Also like to have formal congratulations for Colby and Laura Coulter on the birth of their son, Caden Scott Coulter. He was born on June the 1st, said he was 7 pounds and 10 ounces. <laughs> and he was 20.75 inches long. Not sure the length on that. We always go with that one, but he's going to be a tall one maybe. Um, Evan is a proud big brother, okay? And Scott and Lindy Coulter are the ground, proud grandparents. And Miss Joyce Rushing is the proud great-grandmother just as if y'all aren't keeping track. I do understand that the grandparents and great-grandmother are feeling fine and getting lots of sleep. So, <laughs> Please join us for the first annual Brown Trail Barbecue Blowout. It's just not a barbecue, it's a barbecue blowout. So you get the picture there, right? June the 19th at 6 p.m. It says bring your friends and family and anybody that you think that has an appetite and uh, that's all you need to bring because everything else will be provided. Um, I do want to bring up <laughs> the fact that a lot of men are going to be there the night before getting all the food ready. And uh, they'll be mad that I mentioned their name, but I'm going to do it anyway. Barrett Blackburn, Andrew Cavanis, Michael Johnson, Robert Griff, Griffith, I always call him Griff, and Stephen Alexander will be up there the night before uh, manning the smokers and the grills and all those things. So if late at night you decide that you can't sleep and you want to go visit some people and maybe get a sample, uh, jump up there and see how they're doing. Or maybe just keep them company. Who knows? Don't forget that there are baskets in the foyer to collect cards and gifts for this year's high school graduates, the seniors. Um, the senior Bibles and the gifts will be presented to the seniors at the barbecue blowout on June the 19th. I want to remind everybody of the Vacation Bible School, June the 21st through 24th, and you can register on the church website, and the forms are also available in the info center in the back. Uh, we would like to announce, well, let me back up one step from that. Isn't it great to have someone like Kevin to fill in for Eddie when he's not here? Uh, I appreciate you. I appreciate yesterday the words he had, the graduation. appreciate this morning. What a good, wonderful lesson to have, and... Uh, with that said, he's both of our ministers a little bit long in the tooth, so we think we might need a youth and family minister going forward to take the place of uh, John Morris. I had to do it. I had to do it. I did. Not that I have any gray. Uh, we are beginning to interview candidates, and so I'd ask you to pray for that. They'll be scheduling visits, and uh, hopefully we'll have them actually preach here so that you'll get a chance to meet them uh, before that happens. So play for that, pray for that search for us, if you will, please. If you would, please stand for the closing song and the closing prayer. 225. Sure.
Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for the opportunity to gather together this morning to remember the sacrifice of your son, the love that he showed for us, that he interceded and is the propitiation for our sins. We, we thank you for the plan of salvation that, that you set up from the beginning of time that we could be restored to you. We ask that you be with us now as we depart from here. Help us to keep uh, the love that you showed for us in our hearts and to live lives worthy of that example. It's through your son's name that we pray. Amen.